You know, if you think about this as a court case, so the crime committed is something in the environment is causing diabetes and heart disease and obesity. We don't know what it is. Maybe it's just that people eat too much. Maybe it's that we're not physically active enough. Maybe it's a dietary fat. Maybe it's a sugar. To do an investigation, and there's a lot of evidence to implicate sugar. But it's a little ambiguous. There's no smoking gun. You know, we've got some witnesses. And they're always at the scene of the crime. I mean, they didn't, never have an alibi, but the evidence are not definitive. What do you do? The fundamental lifeblood of their industry was holding on to this fact that there's no definitive evidence that sugar is a death-dealing disease. So as long as they could hold on to that, as long as they could keep the evidence ambiguous, they get to stay alive. If the evidence gets definitive, they're done. What do you do? Is it possible that sugar is toxic? How do you even discuss it without appearing that you are a fear monger? And we're talking about a substance that makes people very happy. It's how we manifest love and joy and happiness in the world. And now you go after sugar, which is something that we give our one-year-olds on their first birthday. It's not that simple to know what the right thing is. New research is starting to find that sugar, the way many people are eating it today, is a toxin. This after a controversial New York Times Sunday Magazine cover story that proposed sugar is in fact toxic. Is sugar toxic? I believe it is. Do you ever worry that that just sounds a little bit over the top? Sure, all the time, but it's the truth. You call, you call, you call sugar a poison, all right? In high dose. Okay, why not use a more alarming term like sugar is Hitler? Medical doctor Robert Lustig, he specializes in treating childhood obesity and he wrote this book, Fat Chance. The thing about sugar that's so pernicious, it's the thing that takes you from obesity to all of the metabolic problems, the hypertension, the diabetes, the heart disease, and likely the cancer and the dementia. And now one third of America has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a disease that wasn't even described until 1980. It is the biggest epidemic in the history of the world. First of all, I don't, I'm not really the anti-sugar guy, I'm the anti-processed food guy. But to be honest with you, I'd rather not be known as anything, and I wish this problem didn't exist. And you know what? When I started in medicine in 1980, it didn't exist. Or it might not have gone into this field, because who needs this? But, you know, I'm here now. You're taking everything we've learned about healthy eating over the last 30 years and turned it upside down. And it deserves to be turned upside down because it didn't work, did it? Well, you said we need an intervention, rehab. Were you being, were you joking around? No, not no. at all. Okay. You want to card kids for Coke? Absolutely. If a parent wants their kid to have a Coke, let them buy it for them. You know, my biggest issue is not being criticized for the science. You know, let's, let's have the debate about the science. That's OK. The thing that bothers me is when they say that I'm uh, not believable, that I'm a zealot. You know, a zealot believes on faith. You know, I don't believe on faith. I am completely about the science. I don't do this because I want to. I do this because there's really no choice. You know, you need somebody like Rob for this issue, okay? It's a very controversial, volatile issue. You need somebody in the academic research establishment to take it on. Um, and Rob has taken that upon himself, and he's very good at that aspect of it. So he is... Um, you know, he's a pediatric endocrinologist who came to believe about a decade ago that 
sugar is the sort of fundamental problem in modern diets. He did this lecture that went viral on the internet. Probably got now about four million hits. Well, he's got this very compelling lecture style. A bit like a fundamentalist preacher I making a point. You wouldn't think twice about not giving your kid a Budweiser. But you don't think twice about giving your kid a can of Coke. Scientists get nervous with that kind of uh, certainty that he represents. It's not um, consistent with what you really want scientists, where you want them to be more aware of the uncertainties and discuss the holes in the data and the negative evidence again. But, um, but you need somebody like Rob. You need him out there saying what he's saying and forcing the issue. This problem affects you at home. This problem affects you at work. This problem affects your business dealings. And ultimately, this problem affects the country and the world. It's not just obese kids. Now, that's what I take care of. That's how I got into this. But this is much bigger. This is more of a manifestation of a societal breakdown. You may have all heard that in 2011, the UN General Assembly announced that non-communicable disease, that is heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, is now a bigger problem for the developing world, not just the developed world. Everybody knew that we had a problem, but now African countries, Asian countries, India, disaster, is now a bigger problem for them than is acute infectious disease, including HIV. What happened? Why is everybody in trouble now, all at once, all over the world? The Japanese live longer than anybody else in the world. And the Okinawans live the longest of the Japanese. The Okinawans have lower rates of most age-associated diseases compared to other nations. Their levels of heart disease are very low. Levels of certain cancers, such as uh, hormone-dependent cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, they're very low. It's partly dietary, it's partly other lifestyle factors. A very healthy diet for, for um, reducing risk for age-associated disease. Very vegetable heavy. A nice balance of protein sources, fish, lean meats. You might think of it as the, the perfect anti-aging diet. It's one of the reasons why we think that the Okinawans live so long. At least they did for many years. Okinawans have gone from the leanest of the Japanese to the heaviest in just a couple of generations. Mainly a post-war phenomenon. Younger generations generally consume a much more westernized dietary pattern than older generations. So there's, there's more processed foods, potato chips and, and soda beverages. And this combination has put younger generations at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Obesity, diabetes. So all of these diseases that are linked to foods that are higher in intake of sugar, salt, and fat. We have never, in, throughout human history, been exposed to the, to the levels of sugar intake that, that we're currently exposed to. So this has got to have metabolic consequences. Here's what's happened to your food over the last 30 years. 1982 to 2012, meats down 10% because we were all told to go low fat. Fruits and vegetables, exactly the same. We're all told we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. You know what? We're eating just as much as we always did. 
And finally, processed foods and sweets, 11.6, 22.9%, a doubling in the span of 30 years. That's where the food dollars have gone. And as we've allowed it, we've gotten sicker and sicker. Of all the packaged foods in the grocery store, 74% of them are spiked with added sugar. Salad dressing, barbecue sauce, tomato sauce, hamburger buns, hamburger meat, all sorts of things. Also, there are 56 names for sugar. Sucrose, table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, high fructose corn syrup, agave, maple syrup, honey, so the food industry can hide the sugar that they add to any given food in plain sight because no one knows what they are. Bottom line, they're all the same. Gallery for calorie, gram for gram, ounce for ounce, they're all the same. And they all do the exact same thing and they all overload your liver and they all cause liver fat accumulation when consumed in excess. Now, remember, it's about excess. It's not about, quote, moderation. So then you have to define what's moderation. Moderation is six to nine teaspoons of added sugar per day. That's moderation. That's what the American Heart Association says. The World Health Organization just said up to 12 teaspoons of added sugar per day. But Europe is consuming 17 teaspoons of added sugar per day. And America is at 19.5 teaspoons of added sugar per day. Bottom line, we're consuming it in excess and it's causing chronic metabolic disease because of it. I was struggling a long time with my weight. I, I hated wearing pants. My stomach always stuck out. I felt uncomfortable sitting in class. I felt like my gut was just bulging out. My heaviest was when I was 14 years old, my freshman year of, of high school. I was 217. Food was my friend. You know, TV was my friend. That's, and that's what I did. I, I watched a lot of TV. I kind of just stayed to myself because I felt like everyone was either making fun of me or critiquing me. I didn't feel, you know, happy. Last time I saw you was uh, April of 2009. And by the way, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Just you just had it recently. Yeah, I'm 20 yeah. now. Tell me how it's going. It's going good. I've dramatically changed my life and I, I feel so much better, so much more alive and so much more confident about myself. When I started seeing Dr. Lustig, I was really sick. I had a very fat liver. Um, my pancreas was working way overtime to, to filter out all that sugar. Um, it was just storing in my body. My body fat, I believe, was almost 50%. You know, I think it was all about, it was really all about what we were eating when I was little. Um, you know, I, my mom wasn't informed about all the bad kinds of things, ingredients yeah. That, yeah. that go into processed food, and especially with fast food, and also sometimes too before eating, I would drink like a whole big cup of juice, and then I would drink another big cup during my actual meal. Right. So, that, you know, it's a lot, it was a lot of sugar that was, was going in it to my was. body. The other thing was when you first came to us, your liver was just chock full of fat. You do remember the ultrasound that you had way yeah, back I when, remember. when you were 10? Okay, it, it, it didn't look so hot. The thing that's really overtaken all of pediatrics is fatty liver disease. I didn't even know about it until 1992, when I saw my first 13-year-old with type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease. And his ALT, you know, a measure of liver fat, was in the hundreds. And I went, whoa, what the hell is this? Well, now all my patients have it. When I first got to Inner City Health Center, it was a real eye-opener. And whereas in private practice, I might per patient have one filling to do or a crown here and there, 
my patients at Inner City Health Center would have a cavity in every single tooth or they'd have massive bone loss and I'd have a 45 year old person who I'd have to tell them I have to remove all of your teeth. And that was my daily routine, just tough case after tough case. Obviously, sugar consumption was the root cause of much of the disease that I was treating. I just kept feeling like I have to do something on a bigger scale. So I went to the conference on gum disease and diabetes in Oregon. They had a keynote speaker who passed out a book called The Fast Food Guide to Nutrition. And on the drinks page, I saw that sweet tea had gotten a green light as a healthy drink. I found myself getting angry and kind of tapped him on the shoulder and I said, hey, you know, how can you possibly recommend sweet tea as a healthy drink? And, you know, I was sort of looking at him and he turned around and very sternly said, well, there is no evidence that links sugar to chronic disease. And I kind of was really shocked at what he said. I mean, I really couldn't even respond. I started to think, well, there must be some sort of political influence here that might be impacting this policy advice that we were getting at this conference. I was at my local library, and I decided to type sugar into their catalog. And a reference to the Great Western Sugar Company popped up. It was a company that had gone out of business in the late 70s. And they ended up donating quite a few of their records to local libraries all up and down the front range of Colorado. And I noticed a particular reference to a collection at Colorado State University that had a line item, I think it was nutrition, maybe public communications. And I decided that I definitely needed to go up and, and take a look and see what was in there. So the first folder I pulled out was the Public Communications Committee meeting minutes. And the very first document, as I flipped open the file folder, had the blue letterhead of the Sugar Association across the top and then said confidential underneath it. I was just standing there going, oh my God, what did I just find? I can't believe this. This is a, you know, a trade association sugar confidential document. And I just sort of stood there staring at it, taking it in. And there's just page after page of this big public relations strategy that the Sugar Association implemented in the 1970s. And so it was a very important time when the Food and Drug Administration was actually reviewing all the scientific evidence on the health effects of sugar. So everything they did during that time period of the Great Western Sugar documents was designed around getting that safety approval from the FDA. And there was this one photo of the sugar executives accepting the Silver Anvil Award, which is like the Oscars of the public relations community. And it was for influencing public opinion about the health effects of sugar consumption. So exactly what I was trying to find, you know, I located in these files. I was giving a lecture in Denver. Why We Get Fat had just come out, and after the lecture, Kristen came up and told me what she had been doing and why she had been doing it, and my eyes lit up. That was how we started working together, me here in Oakland and Kristen in Colorado. There's a growing controversy about sugar. On one side, those who claim it's a harmless source of calories and quick energy. On the other, those who say there is evidence to implicate sugar not only in obesity and tooth decay, but also in hyperactivity and diabetes, among other things. Late 60s, early 70s, lots of controversy going on about the health effects of eating sugar, and it's so similar to today. It's actually pretty incredible. The same debates, the same questions, even the same research is sort of being repeated and discussed. So much so that the industry felt very strongly they needed a very comprehensive public relations campaign to impact public opinion. Thank you. 
and imagine you're the sugar industry. So you're the head of the Sugar Association, and it's your job to assess all this, decide what to do. The sugar industries and the food industry give you money to make these kinds of decisions, and they hire a public relations firm to put together a plan for them, and then the plan is to make sure there's never a consensus. So it started with funding research, gathering scientific consultants that could help them tell their side of the story. It was really an international effort right from the beginning. US, Canada, Cuba, Haiti, initially. In the late 60s, the Sugar Research Foundation changed their name to become the International Sugar Research Foundation, which reflected the fact that the sugar industry was being threatened on an international scale. So now we have England, Australia, South Africa, France, you know, Belgium, all coming together to have the same message. It's not to say one way or the other sugar causes disease. They need to keep it not quite clear so that policymakers can't definitively say sugar causes disease. They just have to keep it muddy. Back with us on this weekend's edition of This Week in Agribusiness from the Sugar Association, Andy Briscoe, representing that group in Washington, D.C. How's the climate these days in Washington for your industry? You know, it's always tough. To, uh, under the new, new administration, obviously, the public health community folks have come out of the woodwork and, and certainly targeting sugar to some extent. For all of the bashing and complaining that there is about sugar, it seems, and all of the dietary recommendations, it still remains a crucial component in our diets, doesn't you, it? You know, sugar is is an important uh, uh, component of, of a balanced diet and a healthy lifestyle. Uh, everything in moderation, as we say, it's all natural, only 15 calories. A calorie is a calorie. If you eat more than you burn, you'll gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you'll lose weight. Therefore, if you're fat, it's your fault. That's basically what this mantra sums up to. Well, you know what? I don't believe in common sense. I believe in data. And the data say something else entirely. What the data say is that some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently. Does sugar cause diabetes? Well, everyone says, well, yeah, but it's because of the calories. Sugar are empty calories. That's the mantra. It is not. This is absolutely not true. Sugar are toxic calories. In fact, Studies from Europe show that if you consume one soda per day, your risk for diabetes goes up 29%, irrespective of the calories, irrespective of your weight, irrespective of anything else you eat. Diet and weight-related illness, they're crippling healthcare. And I have no doubt that this system will collapse. There's no way we will be able to sustain our current level of health care with the growing burden of diet and weight-related illnesses, especially type 2 diabetes, which really, the, the cost of that is already staggering, and we're just at the tip of our iceberg. I don't think people have had an epidemic loss of willpower. I think that we are normal human beings living in an environment that pushes calories and sugar upon us. know that in regard to children and the rising rates of childhood obesity, it's carrying with it rising rates of other chronic diseases. We're seeing type 2 diabetes in kids under the age of 10. We're seeing heart disease in teenagers. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease really is skyrocketing. You develop diabetes or heart disease in your teens, the likelihood of you making it to that 70 plus year old age I think it's pretty darn low. 